Okay, uh, welcome. Uh, so let's go over this question. And this is a perfect example of questions that require you to actually know kinesiology, muscle attachments, and to be able to use that knowledge. Of course, I always talk about applying knowledge, right? You have to use that knowledge to be able to figure out this, uh, this test question, okay? So let, let's talk about it. Uh, you got to be able to assess your clients. This is a perfect example. Okay, question. A client explains to a massage therapist in a pre-massage interview that they commonly experience several he or severe headaches. I'm going to start over. A client explains to a massage therapist in a pre-massage interview that they commonly experience severe headaches that seem to originate in the posterior neck. The therapist observes the client from a lateral view and notices the head and neck appear to be in a pronounced anterior position with a severely flattened lordotic curvature in the cervical spine. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the head and neck being placed into this position? A. The trapezius muscles are experiencing unilateral hypertonicity. B. The levator scapulae muscles are experiencing bilateral hypertonicity. C. The sternocleidomastoid muscles are experiencing bilateral hypertonicity. D. The pectoralis minor muscles are experiencing hyperton or bilateral hypertonicity. Okay, so a lot of words there, right? It's a really long question. Some questions on the exam may be this long and give you an entire scenario and stuff. You gotta break it down, right? Okay, so let's let's talk about the question itself. Uh, the a client explains to a massage therapist in a pre-massage interview that they com commonly experience severe headaches that seem to originate in the posterior neck. So we gotta identify our keywords, posterior neck, backside of the neck, right? So then we think, why would that have anything to do with the headaches? I don't know, we'll see. Uh, the therapist observes the client from a lateral view, so lateral side. So they're looking at the client from the side, right, like this, uh, and notices the head and neck appear to be in a pronounced anterior position with, with a severely flattened lordotic curvature in the cervical spine. Okay, so the head and the neck are in an anterior position. The curvature in the cervical vertebrae is supposed to be like this, right? Go any, any curvature in the vertebrae that goes anteriorly is a lordotic curvature. Uh, curve, right? Uh, so that curvature has has gone back, okay? So it's gone from this to just straight. So that curvature is gone. That's not a good thing. You want a curvature uh, in each segment of your vertebral column, okay? Um, so the head and the neck are forward, right? Uh, and the curvature in the cervical spine is gone. Which of the following is the most likely cause of the head and neck being placed into this position? So now we start thinking about the muscles and, and how the muscles attach, right? So we are specifically looking for muscles that attach to the head uh, because it moves the head, right? Now, some muscles can move the neck and the, ne and the head just kind of comes along. But with this question specifically, we're really looking for muscles that attach to the head, okay? So let's, let's just go down the list and I've got my skeleton here. So we can, uh, we can talk about each one of these. A, the trapezius muscles are is experiencing unilateral hypertonicity. So we look at the term unilateral, that means one side, uni, one, lateral side. So that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense already okay so but but let's just talk about let's just talk about trapezius anyway so it originates up here and origins and insertions are kind of fun right origins are where a muscle starts insertion is where it ends and an insertion is almost always where a muscle performs its action right that's the part of the muscle that will pull when we're trying to uh move a part of the body okay so the trapezius originates on the superior nuchal line and the external occipital protuberance and the spinous processes of T1 through T12. So that's where it all starts, right? And it inserts over here on the spine of the scapula, the acromion process, and the lateral third of the clavicle. So when it contracts, the insertion is going to move towards the origin, depending on the fibers that contract, right? So it'll either elevate, retract, or depress the scapula. Okay, do, do any of those, are any of those going to cause the head to be pulled forward, do you think? Is the head gonna move forward if the upper fibers of the trapezius contract? Now, I want you to think about how it is on your body. And we can look at it in, in a lateral view, right? If the insertion moves towards the origin, this would move this way. Nothing's gonna happen to the head, right? This stays in place. These origins stay in place, right? It's only the insertion that's going to move. So it's not going to do anything to the head or the neck, right? 
Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, we're just gonna eliminate that. So trapezius, even just saying unilateral, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. One side is gonna cause the head to move all the way forward. It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? The levator scapulae muscles are experiencing bilateral hypertonicity, B. So let's take a look at that, okay? Uh, the levator scapulae originates on the transverse processes of C1 through C4, okay? Inserts right down here on the superior angle of the scapula. So when that contracts, the name of the muscle tells you what it does, right? It elevates the scapula. It's really gonna be the same thing as the trapezius, right? Does levator scapulae even attach to the head at all? No, right? It's the transverse processes of C1 through C4 it attaches to. It, it doesn't attach to the head, so how could it possibly move the head? And then we think about it, even if it attached to the head, let's, let's just say it, it influences the vertebrae, okay? So if this and this were pulled together, how is that gonna move the head forward? I don't think it would, I, th I think it would, it would go like this. It would bring the head and neck into extension, right? It's not gonna pull everything forward. It's gonna bring it back and into extension. Ooh, <laughs> right? So we can, we can eliminate that. It doesn't even attach to the head. It, it, levator is one that a lot of people think, you know, people have neck problem with levator, right? Not necessarily, okay? Um, so the sternocleidum, oh, we're moving down to C. C, the sternocleidomastoid muscles are experiencing bilateral hypertonicity. So where, where are the sternocleidomastoid muscles? They're on the, on the front, right? They originate here on the maneuverium and the clavicle, medial side of the clavicle, and then they insert right up here on the mastoid process. That muscle is named after its attachment sites, the sternum, clavicle, and, and mastoid process, right? So remember, insertion moves towards the origin here. So, hmm, bilateral, right? Two sides, bilateral. So if you have both of the sternocleidomastoid muscles, that start he or start here, insert here, and when they when they tighten up, they're both gonna pull this way. They both attach to the skull, right? Would that move the head forward, do you think? Hmm. Forward and down? Like that? Hmm. I don't know. You could test that on yourself. You could palpate these muscles too. Use your body as a cheat sheet, of course. If you can palpate your muscle while you're performing these actions, do it. See which muscle actually contracts. So let's keep that one in mind, shall we? Uh, moving on to D, the pectoralis minor muscles are experiencing bilateral hypertonicity. So here's where it might get a little tricky for some people, right? So the pectoralis minor originates on ribs two, three, or three, four, and five, excuse me. I, I used to work with a guy uh, for a baseball team who uh, the, the first time I ever met him, he was like, oh, the, the pec minor, it actually originates on rib two. If you look at a cadaver, you'll see. And I'm like, maybe the cadaver people just put it back in the wrong spot, dude, because it's three, four, and five. I've worked on cadavers. It's definitely three, four, and five. I've, I've checked since then, just to be sure. Uh, so it originates on ribs three, four, and five, inserts onto the coracoid process. So when, because it attaches to the scapula, it will protract the scapula, right? It'll protract the scapula when these muscles are too tight. So you got the rounded shoulders, right? And a lot of people think because the shoulders are rounded, the head has to go too. Now, you can have multiple muscles contributing to this entire process, but we're specifically looking for muscles that, that move the head and or neck. Now, the the pectoralis minor could influence uh, some other muscles, and chances are, if that's tight, other muscles are going to be tight too that are that are contributing to that. But that doesn't look like it attaches to this at all, right? There's, there's, it doesn't attach to the neck or the head at all, so it can't be pec minor, right? I mean, it could be close. It, it could be, you know, your your shoulders are protracted and it looks like your head is down and, and maybe it is, but it's not necessarily caused by the pec minor, okay? So the answer is C. It is sternocleidomastoid having bilateral hypertonicity. And you can, you can feel this on yourself. Again, your sternocleidomastoid. I know I got my massive beard, right? Sternocleidomastoid right here. Goes from the mastoid process. Maybe I should go this way. Mastoid process to the manubrium and the clavicle. So you can turn your head and you can, to the opposite side of the muscle, you can definitely feel that. Uh, try pulling your head forward like this. Try pulling your head forward and then palpate those muscles. It'd be so much easier if my beard weren't uh, 
aren't enormous, but I can definitely feel my sternocleidomastoid contract when I protract my head and cervical spine, okay? So the answer is C. Perfect example of why you need to know your attachment sites and your muscle actions, okay? Just remember, insertion is gonna move towards the origin. So if a muscle inserts on the head, like sternocleidomastoid, it's going to pull the head down towards the origin in some fashion. So like this, see it's, it's lengthened here. I contract, it pulls, and now it's shortened, okay? It's a little shorter than it is. And I turn this way and it gets a little longer, right? Same thing with, with uh, pulling your head uh, into protraction, right? Protraction, retract, protraction. You can definitely feel that, okay? So that is the answer. Okay, so the answer is C, sternocleidomastoid is experiencing bilateral hypertonicity, okay? So I hope that helped out. Uh, hopefully you, uh, you learned a little and you figured out, like, yes, the, the test is, it's not going to have, you know, direct questions like what is the origin of this muscle necessarily. It's going to give you these, um, it's going to give you these scenarios and, and, problems that clients may experience and you need to know what muscles influence these specific areas uh, how they would influence it know where the muscles are where they attach and how they would move the body okay so hopefully that helped um solid solid question um good uh good effort everybody um so any questions just uh message me email me all right that's that's about it all right later